The process of individuation uses various mechanisms which exist within the mind um, in order for the ego to attain a sense of individuality. Individuation also encompasses gaining a self-concept which is more accurate to reality because if you think of yourself in a way that's contrary to who you actually are, um, it could potentially lead to trouble. A good question to ask if you're wondering whether your self-concept actually reflects who you are is to try and consider how other people perceive you. How does my spouse perceive me? How do my kids perceive me? How do my friends perceive me? And this can often tell you to what extent your self-image matches how others perceive you and can potentially point the way to aspects of your psyche and personality which you are relatively unconscious of. In any case, everybody at some point in their lives will have to reevaluate things, either themselves or even the world out there. The ego has this naturally very rigid and solid structure. I like to think of it as like this crystal. This rigidity is largely a consequence of the fact that the ego consists of ideas and concepts that have already been assimilated and are just kind of being used to illuminate the outer world. So it's very narrow in that sense, and that's why it's also very rigid. Another thing to note is that anytime we are conscious of anything, it presupposes somebody who's conscious, and that somebody is also an object of consciousness, i.e. the ego. And your conscious conception of yourself can entail quite a bit. It's everything that has been kind of covered by the territory of your consciousness. So you're not conscious of your entire ego at any given moment. In fact, you're not really conscious of your ego whenever you're conscious of something else. It's always just kind of like there in the background, but it does have a kind of constructed nature wherein you construct that image of yourself based on various factors. It's based on, for example, your job, your profession. That's a significant contribution to your ego concept, um, as well as how you perceive your own person personality, um, as well as the clothes you wear can go into your self-concept, the way you present yourself externally, and perhaps quite importantly, your values and beliefs. And all of this is tied to the kind of narrative of your life. I've described the ego as being like the central character in the story of your life. So you likely possess a conscious map of who you think you are. But of course, individuation um, makes the assumption that there are there's territory to this map which you haven't yet discovered. This is actually a very complicated philosophical question with respect to, to how consciousness can know things and what consciousness actually knows when it knows anything. Because it's hard to see a correspondence between any conception we hold in consciousness and the actual world, or even, you know, the self. Take, for example, the fact that 1500 years ago, people living in Scandinavia believed that lightning was caused by Thor, just hurling lightning bolts out of rage. Today, we think of lightning as having something to do with, you know, clouds creating these massive static charges. I think. I haven't like reviewed my uh, understanding of lightning in a while. But the question is, are, were the people back then more conscious of the concept of lightning or are we more conscious of it? I don't want to act like there's a definite answer to this because in a sense, both concepts are fictional. They just kind of exist in the mind. So we're both conscious of the same phenomenon, but we're kind of just using different metaphors to illuminate that phenomenon. But you could make the case that the latter is more accurate to the true nature of lightning. And how I can make that claim is that we, I can claim that a conscious conception is better if it provides more utility. So if you think of your moods as being caused by like humors in the body as the ancient Greeks did, um, this gives you a way to treat mood disorders. If you're depressed, just leech some blood out. But if you conceptualize emotions as being related to the production and release of neurotransmitters in the brain, we have a different way to treat mood disorders. And since this way works better, we can make the argument that that conscious conception is more accurate to the true nature of emotions. And who knows, maybe in the future we can further our, update our map of emotions um, to also include the psyche. And maybe this will give us an even better way to treat mood disorders. And then we can make the argument that that conception is more accurate. So my point is that consciousness is always this fictional entity. It, it has to be. Um, but some fictional concepts provide us with more utility than others. And this applies to yourself as well. So if you have a good conscious conception of who you are, that will be useful. For example, are you somebody who gets woozy when you see blood? Knowing that about yourself may influence your career path. Maybe you can't be a surgeon or a doctor anymore. So it is important that our conscious conceptions of ourselves, i.e. our egos, resemble ourselves in a useful way. However, the biggest barrier to self-knowledge is the shadow. Because when we're young, we make a self-concept which necessarily involves discarding notions which we are taught are bad. 
Usually our society or our parents give us the impression that there are certain character traits or even certain behaviors that are bad. And so they're cast in this negative light. And it's very common for our minds to classify the world into good and evil. Even if those are not objectively there, we subjectively kind of project the, the notions of good and evil into everything because that's a very useful um, psychological concept, even if it's not objective. And so it is possible, in fact, it is quite likely that the potential for the ego to grow and expand and encompass more territory conflicts with the fact that we might be exposed to an uglier side of ourselves. The example that I like to bring up, I don't know why this part perhaps speaks to me, is that ultimately we're fucking monkeys. There's so much primitivity in the psyche. And because we live in a society and live in a way that's so far removed from nature, very few of us confront the fact that like underneath this seeming intellect, there's like an unconscious beast. There's a literal fucking animal here. It's really there and, and it's just as wild as any wild animal. I remember when I was young, I was obsessed with like trying to understand how animals think and how they feel until I realized that I can just see for myself because I am fundamentally an animal. I can experience what it's like to be an animal from the inside. But apart from that, there is potentially a lot that can be shielded by the shadow, and these are oftentimes revealed through projections. This is quite evidence with your spouse or partner, for example, because shadow projection in relationships is very common. So when you get irritated with your wife or husband or boyfriend or girlfriend, it often feels like you understand something about their personality which they don't understand. But it's very possible that what you were actually sensing is some quality that belongs to you. And so when you recognize it and see it in someone else, it's particularly salient. And it's complicated. The human psyche is very, very multifaceted. So no, so no character trait is, um, you know, con consistent and stable. So for example, if you despise people who are incompetent, there's a good chance that in certain circumstances, you are incompetent. But by not recognizing that within yourself, you make it easier to kind of pick up on it um, when you perceive it in the external world. So a person can be both competent and incompetent depending on the circumstances. And that's the true nature of being a human being is that we seem composed of contradictory drives. No character trait is stable, so we can often have things that seem contradictory to each other, depending on the circumstances or even depending on the day. So like I said, a person can be both competent and incompetent, but they may only ever notice their competent side um, and suppress any notion which contradicts that image. For example, I know people who can't control their rage at all and just have these crazy outbursts of anger. But then if you ask them about it afterwards, it's just like they can't accept that they have these episodes of uncontrollable rage because they know that isn't a good look. So oftentimes why we have a shadow is because we're, we're trying to uphold this image that we have of ourselves and this image that we want to kind of express outwardly and we want other people to perceive in us. And it's not necessarily wrong to like uphold a particular image of yourself, but it's very useful to know what is merely an image and what is the underlying perhaps uncomfortable truth. But we come to a problem when trying to integrate the shadow and that's the fact that we are naturally repulsed by it. And you can feel this, you can feel this quite often. Any thought that comes to mind that you try to hide, that you try to push away, any possible notion that comes to your mind that you just feel like suppressing or you feel like um, hiding from, you can guarantee that your shadow is involved. So how do we actually go about growing the ego concept? It's actually the anima and the anima's role in the process of individuation to get us to accept our shadows more gracefully rather than just resisting. The ego as this rigid structure operates by exclusion. It excludes contents which then become the shadow. But the anima being this archetype which points inwards um, is characterized more by an, an, an inclusive nature. The ego focuses the conscious mind so that it can be very narrow, but the anima kind of opens the mind so that more contents of the unconscious can be expressed and this is where you can experience them and potentially integrate them. Your shadow may reject and try to push things back, but kind of being in this open anima state allows for these contents to come up and for you to experience them. And the anima is essential in the process of rebirth. Confronting the shadow can often feel like the death of the old ego. But in this state of ego death, the ego has the potential to be to expand and be reborn and you can arrive at a more complete self picture. It can be quite disorienting in this state, especially if you experience it quite suddenly. And it can be triggered by external events like being fired or being cheated on because these events force us to reevaluate re who we think we are. One of the anima's roles in this is to help us process our emotions, particularly various forms of sadness. This is why men oftentimes find it very difficult to cry because crying is almost like accepting defeat and allowing these very painful emotions to come to the forefront. Whereas if you try to avoid sadness, you're just not allowing yourself to, to express how you truly feel about the situation. So the anima's role in this mechanism is allowing the ego to accept new information, even if it seemingly contradicts old notions and even if it's originally cast under the shadow. 
The ego is like this glass ball that can crack under pressure, but you can reform it and even make it more multicolored by heating it up and letting it cool. And when it cools, you have this brand new ego conception, which again, retains the rigidity of the original crystal, but in an expanded form. So this is how the anima has the capacity to extend the ego. It's more open-minded in the sense that it's more willing to contemplate what the uh, masculine side is more willing to reject. And this state of open-mindedness can provide a mechanism for a person to incorporate more information into their self-concept um, and accept it rather than rejecting it. The state of open-mindedness which the anima provides makes it possible to convert that which was originally concealed by the shadow and reframe it, especially in the context of being a human. And by that, I mean, we tend to develop this kind of grand sense of self and ego when we're younger. I discussed that before, um, and it's very natural and it's actually very useful to do that. But this grand self-concept isn't accurate with respect to the true nature of being a human. Because we can't be perfect all the time, we're merely humans. Like I said before, we're basically animals. And like, what would you expect from an animal? You can't expect perfection all the time. And so you need to be able to understand this about yourself. Is that yes, we're flawed, and yes, we sometimes fail to live up to our ideals. The ego may resist this notion, but it's important to actually accept it. And again, this isn't just a mechanism which allows us to gain insights into the shadow, but it's how human beings grow and develop in general. Your life experiences give you more information and it's up to you to accept that information and kind of develop insights from it or reject it and kind of maintain the way you were before. And if you keep doing the latter, you'll just kind of end up in this very childish state where you have no self-awareness and you kind of rejected the possibility of even gaining self-awareness. So a question you might have is how do you actually do this? Interestingly, it, this kind of happens automatically. You actually don't even need to know about individuation for it to occur. I can recall periods of my life where before I had any notion of what individuation was, this process was occurring. And you can probably do the same. You can probably recall states of your life where you were kind of disoriented and it felt like your ego had died and the world had shattered, um, but your ego was slowly reconstructed by a more feminine um, kind of concept within you. But knowing about individuation allows us to manipulate the process in various ways. For example, pay attention to those moments where you turn your attention away from something. For example, if somebody expresses an idea that you disagree with and you feel like shutting them out, this may reveal an area where your shadow is attempting to conceal information which is contradictory to your preconceptions. That's not necessarily always the case, it may just be that you disagree, but consider that there's possibly content here that your shadow is avoiding, or rather your ego is avoiding. The ego is what creates the, the shadow, because anytime you um, expose something with light, it produces a shadow behind it. So it's the ego that actually causes there to be a shadow. So it's possible that what your mind is rejecting is already within your shadow. And again, we're composed of contradictory drives. You'll be surprised to what extent people with very strong opinions will hold the contradictory opinion depending on the circumstances circumstances. This is why we all seem to be hypocrites. It's because context matters and we need to be aware of the contextual factors um, where our minds are willing to change. Because again, that gives you a deeper understanding of yourself. And it also gives you a sense that your, your character is more multifaceted than uh, may appear on the surface. So if there's a conversation you're trying to avoid about, like for example, the state of your life or something about your personality, you can use the knowledge of having a shadow to realize that it may be an attempt by your ego to hide something from you. Um, and it may give you the courage to actually confront it knowing what it actually is. Whereas if you didn't know about the shadow, you would probably just continue to reject it. And that potential to kind of grow your ego is lost. Also take note whenever you feel offended and ask yourself, why do you feel offended? Being criticized can often feel like this mortal blow. So if you're particularly sensitive to criticism, you can use this as an opportunity to deliberately take the blow rather than hiding from it and see, is there something here that's worth integrating? I think what we're all afraid of finding is that in actuality, we kind of suck. We don't live up to our ideals. We're lazy, we're unintelligent, we're proud and arrogant and inconsistent and sometimes morally dubious. But if we want to actually live in accordance with our ideals, the first step is finding out where we need to improve. What are our shortcomings? If we don't know about these, there's no way we can actually rise to that higher metaphysical ideal that we hold for ourselves. It's not easy, not at all. Just think about like how people respond to being criticized. They just kind of shut out any information which, which can be threatening to their ego. But it's the anima that allows us to accept this information more gracefully and makes it possible for us to accept ourselves and even to love ourselves despite our flaws. And it also allows us to kind of, if, you know, if we gain insights into our shadows, use the shadow constructively, redirect that energy towards something constructive rather than destructive. 
There are other ways to induce ego death and deliberately weaken the ego. One that I've been exploring a lot is sleep deprivation and fasting, which again are both potentially dangerous. So you need to um, do these things cautiously. For example, don't drive while you're fasting or sleep deprived. So again, please be very safe. It's the same thing with like psychedelics. Psychedelics are also a way to dissolve the ego, but they need to be done very safely because there are serious risks involved. But psychedelics are actually a good example because sometimes when people take psychedelics, um, the, the, the fear of the unknown, the fear of confronting things which they hadn't contemplated comes up very rapidly because again, your mind is in the state where the ego dissolves and so contents of the shadow can just kind of rise up and you know their contents of the shadow depending on your reaction to them. If you fear them, if you're angry by them, if you're trying to push them away, that's potentially shadow contents. The anima is what allows you to just go with the flow and, and see what comes up see the contents that are rising up rather than trying to push them away. And, and you know, under the influence of psychedelics, if you try to push them away, you're going to have a very bad trip because again, psychedelics naturally dissolve the ego. So if you weaken your ego, you're weakening your ability to fight off those shadow contents. And so if you're very afraid by them and you're, and you're very, and they're very dark thoughts, they're going to rise up and you're going to have to confront them, which can be very scary and very terrifying. And it's, it's what leads to terror trips. But like I was saying, uh, sleep deprivation and fasting, it puts you in this state of mind where the ego is weakened. And you may realize that you're having these very dark thoughts. I think people can probably relate to the fact that when they're sleep, sleep deprived, uh, they're more likely to have very dark thoughts that are uncomfortable. And again, you may notice a very slight weak ego trying to push back. It takes courage to allow these thoughts in. But when your ego is weakened, it's more likely that your animal will accept them and integrate them and actually understand them. Now, there's a note of caution that I should probably say, and that's the fact that not all reconstructions of the ego are necessarily positive. And it's possible that whatever insight you reach that was previously suppressed isn't necessarily healthy. For example, if you've ever had an existential crisis, this is essentially what's happening. Your ego has been weakened to the point where you're accepting information that um, is, is painful and it may lead you to experience an existential crisis. But being in a state of having an existential crisis isn't necessarily positive. In fact, it can be very depressing. So yes, new information has been integrated but it's not information that's necessarily useful. So perhaps whatever insights you do reach through the process of individuation, um, it may be good to kind of discuss them with other people and see what they think. But yeah, anyways, I hope that was helpful. Um, I have discussed this a bunch a few other times. There's also some related videos that I'll probably either link in the description or in the cards up above. Um, but anyways, thanks for watching. Have a good day and may good luck always come your way.